Welcome to Math 31. This is a lesson on the rules for differentiation. So we're going to look at the very basic set of rules that we will be using to uh, establish more complicated rules down the road. Uh, however, these are the real the ones that you use sort of day to day for simple and for complicated um, expressions. So to begin, the constant rule. Now you want to keep in mind with the constant rule that because a derivative represents the slope of a tangent line, if you were given a constant, so by a constant I just mean, and I probably don't need to explain this, but for example, if you had y is equal to 4, I don't know why, but I didn't bring a graph up for this one, but that's a horizontal line. So the slope of the tangent line to a horizontal line is always going to be 0. So therefore, the derivative of this function is going to be 0. So it really makes things easy. And um, keep in mind, too, that this would imply that d dx of the function um, c is equal to 0. So the derivative of a constant value is equal to 0 using Leibniz notation, which we're going to see a lot. Now, the power rule is very important. So anytime you're given a term with an exponent that's a real number, so this would be, for example, y is equal to um, x to the 3, could be y is equal to x to the negative root to real numbers for the exponents. The derivative is always equal to n, the exponent, multiplied by x to the n minus 1. And this warrants a few examples to make sure that you're comfortable with this. So I'm just going to, um, we're going to be differentiating, differentiating a bunch of these in a bit. But for example, if you were going to, if you started with y is equal to, let's say, x to the 5, the derivative of y with respect to x would be equal to 5 times x to the 4. So the exponent gets taken to the front, and then the, um, the exponent would then drop by 1. If y was equal to, let's say, x to the 2 thirds, the derivative of y with respect to x would be that exponent 2 thirds multiplied by x. And now you subtract 1 from 2 thirds. So dy dx is equal to 2 thirds times x to the negative one-third, etc., like that. So that method works for every polynomial term or every term of this form that you are going to encounter. So you will use this an awful lot. And um, then if we move on to, um, let's just do one more before we get too carried away with these. But if you had like something like y is equal to, um, let's say, 1 over square root x, we would first off have to express this in exponential form. So I'll be drawing more attention to that later, but it's critical that you have them in exponential, not in radical form. So square root of x is x to the 1 half, and then this would be y is equal then to x to the negative 1 half. So you express it with with and not as a denominator, even with negative exponents. So dy dx is equal to negative one half x, and then if you subtract one from negative one half, you get negative three halves. Now you're probably thinking, should I go back to exponential form or radical form from there? Answer is that you can, but we will go further with that when we get more complicated expressions. So that's the way these work, and you really have to train yourself to get good at the method. Not that difficult. You mostly just have to remember a few basic things. 
But the constant multiple rule really flows out of this. It's not going to break a lot of new ground. If you're given a function g at x is equal to c times f at x, where c is a constant, then the derivative g prime at x is just equal to that constant times the derivative of f at x, which I'll um, prove in just a few seconds. Now the other way that this can be written, just to totally confuse you with notation, if you're taking the derivative, so d dx with respect to x, of a function c f at x, where there's a constant there, this is equal to c times the derivative of f at x with respect to x. Now before I do a proof, if you had to differentiate just a couple of these. Say that you had y is equal to 3x squared. It simply means that when you differentiate, you multiply the exponent 2 by the 3. So dy dx, using the Leibniz notation again, would be equal to 6x to the 1. So that's really all the constant multiple rule implies for us. We just have to make sure that we do that. And if you had, for example, y is equal to 1 over 4, and then x to the 4 on the bottom, you would still solve this one or, or differentiate it the same way. But you would note that this is really 1 quarter times x to the negative 4. So that x to the 4 on the bottom has to be written up top then as x to the negative 4. And then dy dx, you multiply it out. 1 quarter times negative 4 is negative 1, and then x to the negative 5. So if you wanted that middle step, you would say dy dx is equal to negative 4 times 1 quarter times x to the negative 5. So the proof. Not one of the better, more complicated proofs, but you do get proofs in this unit, so you want to make sure that you know what you're doing. You won't have to do them on exams, in all likelihood, but um, you will see them from time to time, and you want them to make sense. So if you were given a function g at x, which was equal to c times f at x, so there's our constant f at x, it would imply that if we took the derivative of g at x, it would be equal to the limit as h approaches 0, as always, of g at x plus h minus g at x all over top of h. Now recall that g this statement at the top. So if we made our substitution at this point, we would then get l the limit as h approaches 0 so g at x plus h would be actually equal to c times f at x plus h minus, instead of g at x, we would write that as c times f at x all over h. Because there's a factor of c for both of those terms, we could it easily as not factor it out. So I'm going to write that in this form, factor the c out, put a big old bracket around there, and we have f at x plus h minus f at x all over h. And a while back, we looked at the limit properties. And according to the one limit property, the c can be multiplied into the ex or to the expression afterwards. So this would be correct. And having done so, we can now see that this is equal to g prime at x, the derivative of the g function, 
is in fact equal to c multiplied by the derivative of f prime at x, because that's what we have. This represents f prime at x. So we did it. It's established that it is okay to do what we just did. So some of the properties I will prove, others I will not prove. Just sort of pick and choose. The textbook has many, many proofs. So let's um, take a look at the sum rule. The sum rule I'm not going to bother um, proving. It's, it's, it's actually a pretty um, straightforward piece of work. If f at x is equal to g at x plus h at x, then the derivative f prime at x is just equal to g prime of x plus h prime at x. Now just to make things more complicated, I'm going to show you this another way. So this could be written if you wanted, and I always like this sort of thing, the derivative with respect to x of a function u plus v. So you're adding two functions together, u and v, is equal to the derivative of u with respect to x plus the derivative of v with respect to x. So this sort of notation simply means which variable you're taking it with respect to, x. So we're taking the derivative of u with respect to x plus the derivative of v with respect to x. So let's launch into a few questions, eight of them to be exact, and, and follow the instructions on them, and then that should pretty much do us for this section. Oops. Box it off. So differentiate the following. Number one. So this is really dealing with the, the, um, the first property and also the sum rule. So to take the derivative of this, it's given to us as f at x, so I'm going to write it as f prime at x. So there are different forms of notation, and although many of them are correct, they, one might be better than the other. So for this one, I certainly would say, because there's nothing weird going on, um, it's all with, with respect to x. It's given to us in, the ter in terms of f at x. So let's just go f prime at x and not worry about it too much. So we would have to go 1 fifth multiplied by 5. Oops, or how about 5 times 1 fifth x to the 4. Now, I don't, that, I don't want to write that step very often. Plus 3 times 1 third x squared. And then minus 1, well, if you really thought about this, this would be minus 1x to the 0. So if you differentiated that 1, you're going to get 0. But I know you're also thinking, why do I even care? Because we've already worked out the formula for that. So we don't need to do that ever again. f prime at x would be then 5 times 1 fifth is 1x to the 4. And then 3 times 1 third is 1x squared. End of story. So the derivative simply looks like that. And it would have been fine to write it as dy dx if that's what you'd wanted to do. Try another one. The number two, um, this involves a few things. And once again, stop me at any time and work through these yourself and then check your answers. I'm going to do this directly. That x, or pretty directly, on the denominator, that's x to the two thirds. It's cubed root and then squared. So I'm going to write this with in exponential form and then and using a negative exponent to bring it to the bottom. You do not want to have that term on the bottom. Now you will find when you get the quotient rule you can you can um, you know do use the quotient rule on it, but it's way more complicated. If you can take that exponent to the top, get rid of the fraction, you're better off or the fraction with the um, the x term. And this would then mean dy dx. With care, we multiply negative 2 thirds times 3. Now, I'm, I'm not going to do this much longer. Eventually, I'll just do the multiplication. But negative 2 thirds times 3, and then x subtract 1. So negative 2 thirds minus 1. And then dy dx. When negative 2 thirds times 3 is negative 2, and then x when we go negative two-thirds minus three-thirds, we'll get minus five-thirds. And I'm happy enough with that. And we could write this as 
x to the positive 5 thirds and then back in radical form. But I'm going to keep it like that for now. Number three is looking really messy. But the key to making this one work is um, to first off, hopefully we'll have enough room, write this in a simpler form. So this is y is equal to x times x to the one third. So we have two terms, but those can be, can be combined. And then x to the one third divided by x to the one half, and then minus two x to the negative three. And remember that you're adding when you multiply powers, you're adding exponents. So one plus one third is three-thirds plus one-thirds is four-thirds. And then plus x. Now we're subtracting, so you've got to be careful. x to the one-third minus one-half. So I'm not normally going to write this out, but I will for now. This is two over six minus three over six. So it's x to the negative one over six, and then minus two x to the negative three. And the notation, I'll use dy dx. Some of you might go y prime, but you'll see that that's the least um, common way to, to write the derivative. There's really just one key situation where you like to use it. So this becomes 4 thirds x, subtract 3 thirds, and you get 1 third, minus 1 over 6 x. Now subtract 6 over 6, and you get minus 7 over 6. And then you get plus. 2 times 3 is 6x to the negative 4. So notice I'm getting pretty speedy with these. I'm not delaying too long. So negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6, and then the exponent goes down by 1. So negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. You also want to make sure that you don't linger too long in the process. The more times you have to write this down, the more likely you are to make a mistake. So you want to be fairly direct. Let's do a few more. k is equal to pi t cubed minus 3 pi t. Now this is the first time that I've really started to mess around with variables. Because you're told to take this, take the derivative or differentiate the k function with respect to the t variable. So here's our variable t. Now pi is not a variable. Pi is a, um, um, a constant. So this, if we expanded this, we would get pi cubed times t cubed minus 3 pi t. And then we, with care, take the derivative of k with respect to t. And we would, keeping in mind, pi cubed is just a number. So that exponent of 3, the variable in question is t. So this becomes 3 pi cubed t squared. And then this is t to the 1. So when we differentiate it, we multiply 1 by 3 pi, and we get 3 pi. And then we get t to the 0. Now, t to the 0 is nothing. So this turns out to be our derivative. So it's just important to remember that pi doesn't count as a variable. It's not a variable. It's not an x or a y that has a different values. It's always 3.14, 1, 5, 9, and then change. So it just stays in there. And then this one is also with respect to t. So we're taking, we have all these other variables with us. And I am going to be making an assumption. Some of you might challenge at some point. But to me, right now at least, we won't be able to make this assumption down the road. But when you're taking dy dt, t is the only variable. So this k and this x, they, um, they're just constant. So dy dt would mean that we multiply the 2 by the kx, which are just numbers, and then t to the 1. And then this is already t to the 1, so we multiply the 1 by 3qu, and t goes down by 1, and that's it. So they're just numbers. q and u, k and x are just there just there as numbers. The only thing we differentiate is the t. And then the other variables just stay there. They go along for the ride, basically. And number six, this is looking complicated, but it really isn't. 
But we want to simplify first. You always want to do so if you can. It's not that we won't be able to differentiate this, but soon, when we don't simplify, but it makes your life a lot easier. Because this really is x to the 4 divided by 3x cubed minus 6x squared divided by 3x cubed. And then that would give us, I'm going to move to the right, y is equal to 1 third x to the 1. So be careful, because x to the 4 divided by 3x cubed, this is 1x to the 4. So the 1 on top, the 3 on the bottom, they stay put, and then the x goes um, written as x to the 1. And then the second one, 6 divided by 3 is 2. Now you're thinking, I either have x to the 1 on the bottom, or I subtract the exponents and write it as x to the negative 1. Because that's the form we want it in, that's the way we'll go. So dy dx is with respect to x. The derivative of 1 third x is just 1 third. And then plus, because negative 1 times negative 2 is plus 2, x to the negative 2. And you could also write that as 2 over x squared. So the linear terms where the derivative will just be a number. Number 7, nothing bizarre happening here. But um, you just multiply your 4.5 by your 1.8. So even this is true for real numbers, so it's not a big problem. 4.5 times 1.8 is 8.1. So this becomes the derivative of y with respect to the x variable is equal to 8.1 x. Now you subtract 1 from 1 1.8 and you're left with 0.8. The number 8, ds dt, or sorry, ds dx. So first I will write this as s is equal to, now be careful, because that is the cube root of 7x in its entirety, so 7x to the 1 third. Now I would expand this and write this as 7 to the 1 third times x to the 1 third. So ds dx. Now the 1 third gets multiplied by 7 to the 1 third, and then x to the 1 third, when you subtract 1, is negative 2 thirds. Now you can write this a number of ways, no perfect way, but ds dx could be 7 to the 1 third on top, and then the th third, 1 third, would be on the bottom, so and then, you know, just to keep things really nice, let's write this as x to the 2 thirds. But there's more than one way to write your answer with these, and I'm not concerned about it too much yet um, until we get further on. And um, you will have a problem somewhat with many answer keys which do one thing that you don't do. So you're going to spend a lot of time comparing your answer with an answer that's in the back. And even though both are right. And there's not much you can do with it. There's a few guiding principles that we will adhere to, but in some cases it's just a matter of whatever uh, personal or your instructor preference would be. So that's it for me. Now I'll close this off. The next lesson we'll get in into more properties. Thank you for your time.